Okay, we're now recording. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started with our meeting for today. Um, let's see here. Before we dive in, I am going to share my screen real quick just to show our agenda as well as kind of give an update on timelines and things like that. Let me get my screen here. Okay, you should be able to see my web browser now. I'm gonna jump over to, okay, so our agenda today, um, as you probably already saw, is kind of going through any sort of initial feedback we have on the pull requests that have been posted uh, from Atmeyer, both on the REST API side and the Angular side. Um, I know uh, some comments have been added already on the REST API pull requests from um, Alexander, uh, Mark Wood, uh, and myself. So we can kind of talk through some of the high level ideas there. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's had a chance to do the Angular UI review, but we can talk through that as well. So we'll kick off there. And during the second part of the meeting or second half of the meeting, um, we have a, a document that's leaving it at Meyer Head prepared sort of responding to our journal hierarchy use case um, and kind of giving some details around um, that use case versus the, um, the current implementation that's in those pull requests. Um, and this is not necessarily trying to say the current implementation is incorrect in any way, but just sort of admitting uh, where we may not have fully implemented the use case yet. And that gives us an opportunity to start to dig in as to whether or not um, we need to fill those, any gaps there may be before DSpace 7 is released, or if there are certain gaps that we feel it's okay to even allow within DSpace 7 that we may just want to fill in a later release, depending on how high priority they may be. So that'll be the second half of the meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but before we jump into that, uh, just jumping back to our entities working group, let me bump this up here, page, and noting kind of our timelines here. Um, so we obviously are already into November, um, and we have our, we did the initial, some initial assessment of the early prototype, um, and now we kind of have the code to start to work towards um, in terms of actually uh, getting a pull request ready for um, DSpace 7. So we're kind of moving along within our timeline, but I will note that, um, <coughs> and I'm going to keep having coughing fits, it seems. I apologize here. Um, I will note that uh, in terms of our timeline, some of the um, actual goals are a little bit still up in the air. Before the end of November, we would still love to have um, an actual pull request ready to go for DSpace 7, if that's possible. Um, based on our current trajectory, I am personally not sure whether or not we'll be to that by the end of November, but we'll see how things progress, uh, especially between this meeting and next meeting. Um, but I did want to note that um, the current timelines for DSpace 7 just in general are under discussion uh, by the DSpace governance, by leadership and steering. So it's worth kind of noting that um, I don't recall if I went through this in this last in the last meeting. I believe I did, but I'm in so many DSpace meetings and I talk through this so many times that I'm kind of losing track of where I've discussed this and where I've not. Uh, but uh, uh, essentially the DSpace steering group and DSpace leadership group have been talking around um, whether or not to have uh, an early sort of preview or alpha release of DSpace 7 before the end of this year. Um, that decision has still not yet been made as of today, although there is a leadership group meeting uh, tomorrow uh, where we'll probably discuss that in a little bit more detail. However, it's been made very clear by myself and through discussions within the steering group that if we go down this path of having some sort of preview release of DSpace 7 before the end of 2018, that um, that release is not going to be feature, feature complete. Uh, we won't have all the features ready uh, by the end of 2018, and that's just the reality of where we currently sit and based on our current sort of uh, development and, uh, and code review processes, uh, that's just not going to be possible to complete in time. 
Um, so I just wanted to kind of note that this is still all under discussion. The goals of our group are still the same, that obviously we want to, to get configurable entities done as quickly as we possibly can, get them ready for DSpace 7. Um, if that alpha release is going to happen within, um, within 2018, then um, it'd be wonderful if we can have a very early version of configurable entities ready. Uh, but if we miss that timeline for some reason, uh, we can bring that back to, to steering and let them know what our current trajectory is uh, based on our progress basically over this next week or two. I think we'll have a much better picture of, of whether or not we'll be able to, um, to get anything into the main code base before the end of this year um, over this next, next couple weeks. Um, so I just wanted to kind of note that's where things sit. Um, but if there's any questions or clarifications that anybody wants to ask about or make, I know Mick and um, Levin have been in these discussions on the steering side. Um, any clarifications anyone wants to make or any questions around that? Okay, not hearing any. So we'll, our, our basic trajectory is to keep moving forward as quickly as we can um, and see how quickly we can kind of get configurable entities done. And over the next couple of weeks, I'll be bringing this sort of our progress back to steering and we'll have a very good picture of how quickly we're able to move on this and whether or not we'll, we'll have something in 2018 or whether it's much more likely that it'll be in early 2019. So we'll just see how we move. Okay. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and we're gonna jump back into just our agenda in, in general and discussion here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so, uh, so the first topic of this agenda is really to kind of get some initial feedback on the, on the entities pull requests that have come about. Um, as I noted, I saw that there's feedback from um, Alexander, Mark, and myself on the REST API side. So we might be able to kind of uh, give just some general discussion on the feedback there so far. Um, the sense that I got just to sort of summarize things, maybe I'll reshare my screen just so everybody doesn't have to bring this up. Should have thought about that. Let's see here. Let's do a quick screen share. Okay, so here's the uh, initial entities pull requests on the REST API side. And, um, we scroll down here. I know a lot of the comments were pretty, pretty minor overall, so I don't think we need to go through every single comment. And as Alexander uh, noted here, he did some, uh, actually test the code, it compiled, test succeeded, um, and, um, and then made some inline comments within things. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the minor things that Ben has already responded to here because um, some of these are very code specific. I think the main point I wanted to get to was more around, a lot of this is just minor things that we can clean up within the process. Um, so I think there's two main points. One is a, around the fact that um, there is a lot of test data that's embedded within uh, the pull request itself. Uh, which is good for folks who want to, um, to test it. So there's like scripts that will actually create test data for us uh, to allow us to actually interact with it uh, locally. So it's a great thing to be able to have that test data uh, ready and available right away. Um, but obviously it's stuff that we're gonna have to, to rip out before we put it in DSpace uh, itself. Um, so whether or not we start to pull that out now or whether we pull it out before we put it into DSpace, um, I don't think it matters too much to me just as long as we know where this test data all sits um, so that we don't accidentally leave some of it around um, once we merge it into DSpace. So I think that's one point I, I wanted to add, make. Go ahead, Ben. I did add in a note there that uh, I, when verifying the script in detail, it doesn't seem to build the entire tether that I uh, had in mind. So it, it's incomplete. So I think at the moment it will 
already have to delete it and check out a different way to make sure that there's some kind of test data for you guys to easily verify the functionality. Because as far as I can see, it's not something you can just run and have test data in your repository. Start uh, okay. That's good to know then. So then, then yeah, it would be very useful then to remove this, um, these test scripts, both the test scripts and all, a lot of the test uh, configurations, which I know are a little bit further down here. Uh, things like, yeah, mapping to specific handles, collection handles and stuff of that nature. Um, unfortunately, we'd probably have to remove some of that um, and maybe provide it um, externally maybe there's a place we can just add these uh, if there's if we find a way to create that test data and add this uh, configuration in a wiki page or something of that nature that might be an easier place to to make that all work together I don't know yeah, the, the idea was to remove all of the demo data when uh, we would merge into the master branch and then create a, a new set of demo data if you would compare this to what you now see in the Antis prototype uh, live installation that we have running that the document refers to. We added some better examples um, and we will provide those um, in, in like a CSV import format. So you can just easily download a CSV, import it and, um, and some configuration files like the submission, um, things like that. So. Um, okay. It was to split it up before we merge it into the master branch, but we left it in for now because it's useful for everyone reviewing it to to be able to easily test things. Yeah, I think that's that's okay as long as we know how to use this to test things. Like, I don't if we can't create the data that we need to make these handles work, then it's not useful. That's kind of my point. Um, but if the okay. data is easy to create. Then, then I'm okay with leaving this around. But it sounds like what Ben had said is that it's not really working right now, anyways. So we may want to consider, reconsider how we're approaching this. And provide a different way to provide that test data, whether it's via CSV, like you mentioned, leaving, or whatever. Um, I agree, it's great to have that test data easily available. Um, we just want to find a way to to utilize that easier. Um, so, so that's the one point. Um, I think the only other main point is, I, is really one that Mark made uh, around the idea of, of an entity, uh, the entity object class, and the fact that um, uh, it was surprising to him that entities in the, the entity object class is more of a utility class, and it's not actually an object. So he, he noted that uh, he was surprised that an entity is not actually a subclass of item um, and that instead um, we've always been talking about how an entity is an item but in this particular class and it's more like an entity has an item uh, which is a misrepresentation so and then there's also a, a response to that as yeah. well so the, the the thing is that that class shouldn't have been named entity it was just a poorly chosen name um, and our preference at the moment because we discussed this before this call would actually be to move these methods to the item, to the item class, because that's where they belong. If items can have relations, then they should be in the item class. And a subclass of the item class is not necessarily the best design from, a, um, from Mark's point of view. So we totally agree with Mark's comment. Um, yep. And uh, we would actually prefer not to rename this class, but actually put it into the item class. But if you want to go a different direction, that's fine as well. No, I was actually wanting to bring up that discussion so we could talk through it. Because I was having those same thoughts when I read this and I saw Ben's response as well. Um, so just before this meeting, I was kind of jotting down notes to myself. Um, and I think that's, that's perfectly fine by me. I was actually torn between the either subclassing or adding the methods directly into item because I wasn't sure which was going to be easier for our first stage essentially. But if it seems reasonable enough to really move these methods down to the item level, um, I'm fine with that. I think the one implication that has is that um, that essentially means we're, we're not really creating anything that is an entity in terms of um, the word entity uh, may not have any meeting within um, within the code base, 
which means we also may want to look where it's used elsewhere. So um, is there, like I think the other example is entity type. There's a database table named entity type and an object named entity type. Um, does that still remain the name entity type if we remove the idea of an entity out of the code base area? So um, it's something to consider, like whether that needs to now be an item type, essentially, if everything is now an item and we're just kind of dropping the conceptual object that is an entity, at least in this code base area, or code base layer. And that also then bubbles to things like the REST API, um, whether or not you actually have an endpoint that is called entity um, and things of that nature. So I just wanna note that there is an implication around what we do here. Um, and I don't know whether you've kind of thought through the full implication here or whether you're just kind of looking at this one, one scenario right now. Yeah, we were just looking at this one scenario now, but we'll, we'll take a look at that. And I, I mean, I think it is best to have consistent use of terminology yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll take a look at all those things and 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 uh, um, let you know what we think is the the easiest way to go. Unless you have a strong preference to say I want everything to be um, named with item or item type and not entity. Um, I just want us to choose one or the other. To be honest, I don't want it to turn into a scenario where. In some areas, entity is represented as item and it's named as item, and in other areas, it's named as entity, because I think that becomes massively confusing to developers. So uh, um, I think that the trajectory has been that entities really are just items that have a type, and in that situation, it makes sense to me to just call them items if we want to. Uh, but if there's some scenario that I'm not thinking of where it makes more sense that they actually, there is an entity object, then I'm not against that. I just want us to have consistency. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Okay. Well, I've written it down. We'll make sure to make a clear choice and make every, all the naming consistent. Yep. Yeah. And at the moment, the entity itself is not present in the database as a concept and not present in the REST API as a separate concept. So it's only the specific class where, we, where we're using that entity object. So it may make more sense to move it to the item because that's where it's represented in, in the REST as well. Right. Yeah, I agree with that, Ben. I, I was just noting that the confusing point then because, becomes like that entity type table where that is represented in the database layer and it is an actual object, but maybe yeah, it shouldn't exactly. have the word entity anymore. Okay. So, so yeah, I, I totally see the point here. I just want us to be consistent about our terminology at the, for developers to make it easier for developers to grasp. Sh um, should it be called um, item type or something like that? That's what I would lean towards is just calling it item type or seeing if that item type table also, I know there was questions early on as to whether that should really just be a column on the item table. I don't know. Uh, but for now, the simple solution would be to, yeah, just call it item type. Um, if we're naming everything else item, then let's be consistent and really kind of almost scrub the word entity from everything at the Java layer. Uh, which would also probably imply that it also gets scrubbed from the REST API layer. Um, because if everything's an item, then the REST API is just talking about items as well. Uh, but I, I don't know the implication of that. So I'm just, I'm noting that, that that seems like a reasonable direction, but we need to look at the implication of whether or not there's anything that we can't really scrub the word entity off of. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do a review of, of everything in the code and in the database and, and um, make a proposal by next week for more consistency. Um, and, but we'll hold off on refactoring all those things until the review is done and just take that as like a feedback point that has to be processed before it goes into the master branch. Um, but we'll have a, a proposal for that by, by next week. Okay. Uh, in two weeks, sorry. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Yep, and it makes perfect sense to not necessarily keep changing this pull request until all the feedback's done. So 
And I think the overall feedback, the overall perception I got was, was good feedback. Um, I think this was the most confusing point, and I think it was a good point of Mark noticing um, that misnaming, which kind of made me rethink all this myself. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, was there anything else, any other main points we wanted to talk through within this initial feedback on the REST API side? Um, Alexander, was there anything you wanted to specifically mention? I know most, most of the things you, you noted seemed like they were small fixes that could be made relatively easily. Yeah, um, I don't think that's a major uh, issues. Okay. Thank you. And um, Paulo, I know you hadn't had a chance to review it yet, but will you have a chance to do your review um, within the next week or so? If you yes. get your database working, <laughs> yes, uh, I'm. I'm just uh, stuck with this problem, but uh, I will. Um, I will try to 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 make some contribution. Okay, thank you. Um, so that <coughs> excuse me. So that's all good on the REST API side. I guess the question then is on the Angular side. Um, the Angular pull request has not had any feedback yet that I've seen. Has anybody had a chance to start to look at that? Uh, no, I, I tried when I did the the, the uh, pull the the pull request. Uh, sorry, the um, the Git uh, checkout. Um, I, I did only for the 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 space branch, not the, the Angular. So, uh, and I think at that time I didn't have the um, the Angular uh, already uh, available, uh, I think. Yeah, it does kind of require getting the REST side up and running first, uh, just so you can kind of run the REST API locally um, and then point the Angular side at that, um, but uh, but but yeah, it would still be useful. Although I guess, is there a demo REST API that has? I guess there is a demo REST API that we could potentially review the Angular side against. Correct, Levin and Ben, maybe. Yeah, there's an the, entire the, pro proto Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, the the links that Levin has sent out um, for the example you write do use a public REST API as well, so you can easily use that. REST API for testing Angular if you want to, so that you have the data that we are providing at the moment and you can do anything with Angular you want. Okay, that, that's, that's very useful then. Um, I, I need to find, yeah, I need to look at those links, but we can share, for those of you who are new on the Angular side, it's really just, there's a configuration um, then you can point it at whatever REST API you want. So if we ch tweak that configuration, which I need to find myself, um, we can add instructions into that Angular pull request to, to note the configuration and what you can update it to in order to use the Atmire demo site, because that would essentially allow you to not even need to run the REST API locally. You can just install the Angular pull request, uh, bring it up and running, and it'll use that demo REST API behind the scenes and allow you to to test it out and play with it. Um, but we need to add those instructions into the pull request for Angular is what I'm kind of noting here. Um, and that's something I probably should be able to figure out. I just need to look, I need to find that configuration again. I always forget where it's located. Let me write myself a note here. Okay. But that'll make that test process a lot easier, both for um, uh, for you, Paulo, as well as um, Alexander. I'm assuming is this something you'll be able to to test within the next week or two if we can get you those configurations, especially. Uh, yes, I think so. I will try. Uh, the configuration is maybe in config environment default JS. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I just couldn't couldn't find the link to it directly. I was looking for it rapidly in the actual code base, but you're right. It's in the main config for DSpace Angular. 
And if you have any issues or roadblocks when you're trying to review um, the Angular, feel free to poke me on the uh, Slack chat. So. Okay. Yeah, here's the, the config file I'll added into the entities working group channel. It's the environment.default.js and there's a section for that REST API. So if we just update the host information and the namespace information there, the path information there, um, that should work to point at the, uh, the Atmeyer demo REST API for entities. Okay, and I can add the, I'll add those instructions into the, into the PR itself um, after this meeting, so that'll be easier. Okay, so is there any other information that anybody here needs to be able to review these pull requests? Because again, I, this is an area that I could really use help in, in this review process. I'll also try and get to the Angular uh, pull request review here over the next week. Um, but the more eyes we can get on just testing that, um, even if you don't understand Angular code so well, if you can give it a test, um, see how it's behaving um, and all of that, or ask questions. I think that would all be very, very useful feedback into this process. But is there any other information anybody else wants here before we close up this particular topic? Okay. Not hearing any. So in that case, we'll go ahead and move along to the second topic on the agenda. <clears throat> and that would be um, the journal hierarchy uh, use case, our initial use case description, um, and comparing that to the original implementation that exists within those, those pull requests. And so this is specific to the journal hierarchy use case. We're not yet looking at the author profile use case, that second use case we had talked about, um, just because we want to tackle one at a time, uh, and each one may provide um, a good number of discussion points. Um, but uh, but Lee and I might hand this over to you here to kind of walk through um, what is sort of implemented uh, versus what is not implemented. And I think the more important part is trying to get to, to where those gaps may be so we can start to kind of identify the gaps and understand um, which gaps we feel are, are really high priority, like we really need to get these in. Um, versus which gaps um, may not be a big deal. Sure. You want me to share my screen and uh, walk you through the document? Uh, yeah, I think that'd be useful. Okay. Yeah. Hold two. One second. I have a lot of windows open, so it's hard to find the right screen to share. I think it's this one. Okay, yeah, that's the right one. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> um, so it's basically a copy of your use case points. So it starts with um, the first like five or so points in your use case. Journal can be represented on a journal page, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have a little bit below the hierarchy user's story or you know, it's more like a narrative. Um, and then at the end, there's uh, a, referen uh, there, uh, a reference to where the code and the configuration is and uh, the, doc the original documentation is because that already included those two use cases to a certain extent. Um, and then at the bottom, there are some discussion points, things that are can be improved. So I'll walk you through. So we have a journal. Um, we've taken a journal from a competing technology that most of us know um, that is linked here in the comment. So this is a journal hosted in a BPress digital comments and you can browse through the volumes and the issues. And we have duplicated the volume seven, issue one and issue two with all of its articles. So you can drill down into the volume, you can drill down into the issue, and then you have the articles in an overview. 
and then can click on an article to get the metadata and to download, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So that has been replicated. So here you have a Journal of Financial Therapy item page. You see here at the top the two volumes that are associated with that um, particular uh, journal. You can go into the first volume. You have the two issues, um, same way as in the other, as in the, the B Press example. And you can go into volume seven, issue one, and then you have your list of articles, in this case without thumbnails, but you'd have thumbnails. Um, with their abstracts and everything. And then you can go into a particular article and you're on the landing page of that article. And then you can go back up into the volume, uh, sorry, into the issue, into the volume, and back up into the journal. So it has the same hierarchy with a little bit richer metadata than what you saw in, for example, this page here with um, the volume. So. It has the journal level metadata. It has the logo um, as was stipulated in the use cases. It has a list of all journal volumes sorted by volume number, as you saw here. So volume seven comes before volume eight. We could have turned that around and have the more recent at the top. Um, but the list is not paginated because in your original use case, it said paginated list of all journal volumes sorted by volume number or date, but also searchable. And this goes into a discussion at the bottom that about how do we display relations? Because in this original use case, um, uh, it always said sorted, but also searchable. Um, and then uh, and some other ones paginated, uh, I believe that was in the issue, yeah, paginated list of all articles in the journal sorted by page number, but also searchable. So we are not convinced that that should be the case for all of the relations, but it should kind of adapt to how many you have and what entity type you have. So the, the right. You should have some configuration control over what you want to do. Um, for example, in, in this case, the, the issues, there are only two in this volume. So paging searching is not really useful. Um, and even within the issue, the number of articles is quite limited. And you can see in their example as well that there is just an overview and you can search into in a journal or um, across the entire repository. Um, but having a search here might be overkill. Um, pay, pagination could have been useful here, um, but we have a proposal uh, at the bottom of the document about how we can um, have cutoff points for and configuration for specific uh, item types. And let's try to stop using the word entity, but item types to say, okay, no, for this item type, I don't want it to be in a search or a pagination, even though there might be more than X relations, for example. Okay. Um, so then I also showed you the volume page already. The same, I'm linking to the same display of relations discussion section here. Then you have um, the journal issue um, and there, a small comment about a bug that is the virtual metadata from the journal and the volume was requested here. And if we look at the issue page, the data from the journal volume is here, but not from the journal itself. So no ISSN number from the journal and not the journal title. Um, and that's just because there is a bug in the second, third re level relationships, but um, that's been scheduled already. Somebody's working on it. That should be resolved in the next few days. And not to stop you here, Levin, but real quick, just to note, um, I can't see all these comments that you have on your screen when I look at this particular document. Yeah. So um, I think it's because you only gave us view rights. Um, so I'm just noting that I think these comments add some useful context. Um, that I was not aware of when I first reviewed this because I can't see them. Okay. Um, I will take a look at the share options then. Yeah. You don't have to do it now. I'm just noting that I just realized that because I, I was like, I don't remember seeing all these comments in here. But yeah. Ah, okay. 
All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at that. Sure. Um, and that's basically the, the a, a comment that reoccurs on the other levels as well, of course, like in the article page, the journal title and ISSN and the volume number is not included, only the issue number. So everything that's a second or third level um, relationship um, needs to be fixed. Uh, make sure how to describe the various entities created. That was already included in our original documentation of how you create a data model with the XML, et cetera, et cetera. So I put a link there to the original documentation. Um, same for virtual metadata. Um, that configuration was also in the original documentation, but I added a direct link here as well. Um, that, of course, does not at the moment include the second and third level of the hierarchy, but we'll add that uh, shortly. Um, then about the user story. So this explains a little bit more like your community collection structure and how what you do when a new issue is published and, and how you can submit things. Um, might be interesting to note that um, we have done submission through uh, a DSpace 6 XML UI. So we install that on top of the DSpace 7 database and we just use that for submission at the moment. So it is possible to submit these through a user interface, um, just not from the DSpace 7 user interface yet. Um, so those examples have actually been submitted through um, uh, a user interface, but a DSpace 6 one. So that shows that the concept does work and that it also is very much in line with how DSpace has worked so far. Um, the fact that we can use a DSpace 6 to do that. Um, I don't think there's much to discuss here. Just read it in detail at some point. If you have any comments, feedback, suggestions, feel free. Um, we've also provided a bulk import for the second part of the user story. So a submitter should be able to, to submit an entire issue at once, including all articles within the issue. Um, that's also available. That's also been tested. Um, there were a few issues with that that have been resolved like yesterday or today, um, but only minor things. Then the next user story also goes into some discussion, um, which is permissions on relations. If an article has been submitted separately, it should, a submitter should be able to link it up to its issue. Um, <clears throat> this basically says that if I submit an article, but I haven't submitted the issue, that I should be able to attach it to an issue, which could be okay, um, um, but I, it, it's a discussion about how, what kind of permissions do we want to set for relations. This also mm -hmm. um, occurs in the other use case with the author um, author profile, like can I link something to someone else's author profile if I've submitted the article or vice versa, right. <laughs> vice versa. What we would suggest at the moment for at least the alpha release of DSpace 7 um, would be to uh, implement it in such a way that if you have edit rights on one of the two items that are involved in a relation, um, that, you'll be, that you're able to link or unlink them. Um, that would allow sufficient control from both sides, right? So if, if I attach an article to a journal issue that I shouldn't have attached it to, then at least the person who is in charge of the journal issue who submitted that can unlink it. It's not the perfect situation, um, but it would be a workable situation. It also would work for author profiles. Um, <clears throat> But in the section permissions on relations, we're discussing that in a bit more detail where you actually um, could have a particular permission that is attached to a relation that can determine whether or not it can be deleted or things like that. So that's a discussion point. We'll get to that later. Um, should be able to submit a partial issue and submit additional articles at a later time. Um, that's fully supported. I can now add another article to those issues that I just showed you. 
Um, that's not a problem at all. Um, an entire issue should support embargo, which applies to all articles in the issue. So the situation there is that since you know we're talking about items and not entities, so they're all items, um, an embargo can be applied to each of those. So it can be applied to the issue, it can be applied to all of the articles, but it doesn't automatically um, propagate through the hierarchy. So if you apply an embargo to the issue, it doesn't necessarily um, propagate to the articles of the issue, but you could do it for each individually and set it to the same embargo date. <clears throat> I think it's up to this group to decide if we need something like that kind of propagation now, or if that's something that can happen later. Um, alternatively, you can also let everything sit in the workflow and only like give them the final approval um, when everything can be released. So I think there are two alternatives and we would argue that currently it's not really, it's more convenience to be able to have it propagate through the hierarchy. Um, and it's something that can be quite easily added later on. Okay. If somebody disagrees, do interrupt me. Um, yeah, I think that's a worth. That's probably another discussion point. I think, to be honest, I think we should add that as another point of discussion because I think that becomes important to make it easy to to work with embargoes, um, especially if you're in. I, but it may depend on the submission process. So if you're having to submit each of these objects individually, then yeah, maybe just having each have an individual embargo is good enough for now. But if there's a way to submit an issue with all of its articles, then you really need to be able to embargo all of them at once. So, but I know we don't have the submission all figured out. So I think this is a possible discussion point for the future, but we need to kind of look at the submission process. Yeah, I totally sense. agree that it should be supported at some point. Um, mm -hmm. Question is if that should, when that should happen. Um, right. I'll put it in the same section. Um, That's fine. And well, I can yeah. always add it down there because I think it's important for us to get down to these discussion points as well right now too, if there's no other major points since we only have about 15 minutes left. Uh, yeah, there's only one other point. Uh, let's see, so search. Yeah, we still need to add um, a search through all the articles in the journal because that is um, dependent on the second and third level of virtual metadata. So we need to add the identifier of the journal to the article through virtual metadata in order to provide that search, but that's also um, been scheduled already, so that shouldn't um, take long. Um, let me see. Yeah, in the same um, discussion, to maybe also yeah, should be added to discussion points, is applicable to deleting and withdrawing um, objects. Yeah. But we are not really sure whether you really would want that. So it's explained in more detail here, but just very briefly summarized. We think that the, the data model it itself should dictate whether um, deletes are, uh, what needs to happen when an object is deleted that has relations with other mm -hmm. objects. Um, and the two examples that we give is like it, it actually deletes everything else so that you know if you have an issue that you delete that it deletes all the articles but you could also want the, it that if you delete the issue um, that all the virtual metadata that has been mapped through those relations first second and third level and so on to the article are automatically copied into the article itself as plain text right so let's say your article has the ISSN number that's there through virtual metadata through its connection with the journal. If you delete the, an issue, for example, and you destroy the relation between the journal and that article, that, if, that you might not want to delete the article, you just want to keep it, but map all of the 
or copy uh, uh, all of the virtual metadata into the article. And so I don't think we should assume much about how to handle deletions in, um, at the moment, but we should think about how do we make this dependent on the data model and your definition of a data model or allow right. that choice at least to the user. So and I understand that. I think my, my bigger concern here on this one is actually with the withdrawal. So if you need to withdraw an entire issue uh, for whatever reason, maybe there's a copyright is issue or whatever, or you need to withdraw an entire journal, does that suddenly mean you're having to go in and manually withdraw 50 objects instead of just clicking withdraw on the entire journal? So th that also depends on, on, on what you want, right? I mean, right. No, I agree. I'm it's... just noting that, that, with this concept of relationships, I think these are all interrelated. This delete problem, this withdrawal problem, mm -hmm. and the, um, the other one we were talking about, the embargo problem. I think they're all interrelated and it's just pointing out that when we're creating these relationships, there are some types of relationships that we almost, that users might expect there to be some sort of inheritance, um, what a, inheritance of the deletion action, inheritance of the withdrawal action, inheritance of the with embargo action, uh, action. Um, almost like their parent objects in the way that a community collection and item, you know, have that sort of hierarchy. Because um, when you get into this hierarchy sort of relationship and mapping that, that's almost an expectation out of the concept of, an, of a hierarchy. At least I've seen that expectation and that comes up all the time with communities and collections and items within DSpace and people complain about, I changed the permissions on my collection. Why didn't those propagate or inherit down to my item? Um, and I think that's gonna become even more relevant in the case of configurable entities, especially with like journals and things. I think people are gonna really complain about this. Um, well, the, so we need to consider. Yeah, of course. But the, the, the point that we're making here is that it depends on your data model, right? So let's say uh, author profile and articles. If I delete my author profile, I don't want to delete all the articles. Oh, right. Yeah, I agree. I'm so I, that's why I'm calling it like an inheritance or whatever it is that some of these relationships have some sort of inheritance um, that is almost enabled that this, this relationship is very hard link that, that it inheritance th inherits things from this upper parent object, whereas these other types of relationships are more of a soft link. They're just saying this is related. And, and those soft link relationships, um, yeah, nothing gets inherited across that. If you delete, withdraw, embargo, it doesn't really matter. Um, the other object should not be affected. But there are certain types of relationships that people are gonna have that expectation coming in that, that this inheritance will occur. Um, and I don't know how to solve it right now. I'm just trying to note that this, is, this seems like a common thread that we may need to kind of talk through more and figure out whether we need this in DSpace 7, whether we can push it back. Um, how do we describe the fact that, some, that these relationships may not have an inheritance happening between them at all? I don't know. So, so the two solutions that we discussed a little bit internally was one, two, habit, um, be presented as a choice to the user. Um, you know, when you delete something it says, Hey, you know, these is, this is the set of objects that you have relations with. What do you want to do with it? And you could have a select all and say, delete everything, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and alternatively that you, in your, um, uh, data model definition in that XML can say, this is a hierarchical, uh, relation. And if I delete you know what, and then what do you want to happen with the deletion, for example? That those are two possible implementations. Um, the UI one might be good for the initial implementation, and further def definition into the data model might be useful for the future. Um, because the UI one would work. I mean, people would, I think, be or users would be happy with that. Um, but it would be more useful or more usable if you have it on the, the, the data model level so that you're not presented with that question every time, like, hey, what do you want to do with the relations? And it just happens as you've defined it in, in the data model. So, um, right. 
Okay. Um, and then the other discussion points, um, maybe first going to dive into display of relations because we have been um, implementing something for this already. So the proposal here is just that, um, like if, if you, that you have cutoff points and the cutoff points are the number of items in the list and the, the relationship with the entity on whose page that it's shown. So you can have kind of like an override and say, hey, for issues I don't want, you know, I always want it to display in this way. And in every other scenario, it would, um, it would be determined automatically based on the number of items in the list. And you could in, your, in, in a configuration um, say, okay, if it's, less than five i just want a simple list if it's uh, more than five but less than 20 i want uh, pagination and if it's more than 20 i want a search and you could also say hey on an author profile page i always want to search i don't care if it's three five or 200 mm -hmm. for example so and that's something that um, yeah, there is an implementation suggestion there as well of how to tackle that in Angular that Art came up with. Um, and since it is uh, 24 hours for the basic, so three days for the basic implementation, we think that it's useful to add that um, now um, because that would make everything more usable on the user interface level. Yeah, I mean, I, this sounds reasonable to me. To be honest, when I when I was saying pagination in these various use cases, I never meant that page that paging always exists. Uh -huh. I always kind of had the assumption, but I I guess I never wrote it down that there had to be a cutoff. That obviously you wouldn't have pagination on five articles or two articles or something like that. Um, so it makes total sense to me that to implement this sort of cutoff. Okay, yeah, that's schedule already, so we'll have that progress. Um, and then permissions on relations. Uh, I already discussed it briefly. So if you want to go further than to say, okay, if you have added rights on either of the two items that you are linking up, um, it would require quite some extra work. Um, to be honest, I, I think that sounds good enough to me. I'm curious what others think, but I, I honestly think that sounds good enough because that would allow administrators to do anything they wanted, of course, and then it'd allow like authors to be able to manage particularly their author profile and link articles to their author profile. Um, it seems reasonable to allow that that be, if you have edit rights on either of the two items, you can link them. But what do others think on this? Paulo, were you I, yes, uh, I was just thinking what, what I, I was going to say. Um, I think uh, the other possibility is to uh, make uh, these relations as uh, this space object. I don't know if... Uh, and then we, we can... Uh, set the... the um, the, the permissions for each or collection or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, that is something that we have discussed as well to use DSpace object um, for that. Um, and it, it also, it's related to the um, two author profiles, so name variants as well. Um, so if you would use um, DSpace objects to represent relations, then you would also have metadata and types of metadata available, um, which would also serve the purpose of name variants. Um, but it is a significant refactoring and we have discussed it. Um, but we would like to look into it in a little bit more detail by our next meeting to make sure that um, we fully covered all the bases and all of the pros and cons that come with it. 
So just to be clear, but the author profile case, um, so uh, in the author profile use case, you have um, two use cases, one with um, uh, having a name variant attached to your relation and another one with having um, a date attached to the link between a person and an org unit. And so if the relation would be a DSpace object, it would be possible to say, hey, I'm attaching this piece of metadata to this relation and this is an author name and the other one um, is a, a, a date, for example. So it, it would have some benefits, um, but we're still looking into um, what the full implication of that is. Um, but it would also be useful for permissions as well if we want to go further than saying that if you have added permissions on either of the two objects in a relation that you can, that you have uh, added rights on the relation, so. Okay. Yeah, I understand that. I, I guess that seems like an odd model to me, but I could be convinced otherwise. So I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from commenting. Yeah, we're not convinced uh, um, ourselves yet. So it was something that came up in the last week or so. Yeah, um, but I can definitely understand there could be some benefits there. I'll just see what you all come up with and we can discuss that in more detail, perhaps in our next meeting. Okay, but what I'll remember for now is that uh, permissions as we proposed at the moment is fine. Um, display of relations as is proposed is fine. Yep. Um, delete, withdraw and embargo, um, whether or not to have things propagate um, downward into a hierarchy needs some additional thought. Yeah, I think that's accurate. I think that's an ongoing sort of discussion point as to whether or not hierarchy propagation is a, is a requirement or if we can work around it, uh, like you noted, with just having some sort of option that appears in the user interface for those actions that could propagate and just give them the option to apply it to all instead of just the single object they're working with. Hmm. So either, I mean, that might be a good enough solution for DSpace 7 is just have an apply all option that they can select for things that would propagate in a hierarchy. But I think that would also imply still that we need to know which types of relationships are sort of hierarchical in nature and which types of relationships are just that soft link. Because I don't know that you ever want to give people the option when they're deleting their author profile to also delete all their articles at the same time. Well, that could be useful as well. I mean, it will- It could, as long as they have edit, delete access, I guess, to all their articles. Yeah, true. Those could be created by someone else or whatever else, but yeah. True. Yeah, it could still be useful, I guess. In any case, we're running out of time here. So we'll, yeah, we'll leave that discussion point for, um, a few, for the future here. Uh, let me look at our, agenda then. Um, so for next time around, um, we will have some more reviews done on the Angular side of things. We got to get reviewers in on the Angular UI um, and start, it, start to finalize the reviews of the REST API so we can start to move that forward. So we have tasks on, on the actual code itself. Um, and then uh, from my understanding, um, Levin, you'll have a similar document like this on the author profile use case that we can review similarly like we did with this journal hierarchy. So we can talk through that Correct. Uh, for our next meeting. Um, and then is there any other topics that we have on the agenda for next meeting already? Those are the two I think that I have right now. Feel like there might be a third. Um, obviously, we'll we'll add more to it as we go, but but at least those two will be in our next meeting, um, and our next meeting again will be in two weeks. So that would be on Tuesday. Oh, I have the date wrong in this agenda. Tuesday, November twentieth, not twenty third, November twentieth. So two weeks from today, um, at the same time, um, will be our next meeting. Anything else, folks, want to add before we wrap up? Okay, not hearing anything. So we'll talk again in two weeks and obviously we'll talk between the meeting on Slack and uh, GitHub. So thank you all again and uh, talk to you again in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.